In the 30s, the treatment of vascular disease was limited to amputation, sometimes division of the tendo Achilles and lumbar sympathectomy. Well, in Australia, there was a very small group uh, starting out in vascular surgery in the 1950s. I think Alan Sharp was a great uh, originator. Didn't get much recognition, I don't think. John Lowenthal, also in Sydney, was a was marvellous supporter to us when we started. Now, when I first got to know Sam, he was already doing hundreds, and I thought Sam was doing more arterial operations than anyone in the country. But it was all happening pretty quickly. By 1959, um, everyone was doing arterial operations. Uh, at that time, uh, a new appointment was made in terms of a full-time uh, surgeon who was known as the surgical supervisor. Uh, I think Bob Shannon might have been the second of those surgical supervisors. He developed a particular interest in uh, acute arterial disease because he had to face the abdominal aortic aneurysm patients. Very experienced, acute uh, general surgeon and a very capable one. In the early days, vascular surgery, in the North Island anyway, was done by cardiothoracic surgeons or cardiothoracic and vascular surgeons. And that followed on largely from Barrett Boys' training at the Mayo Clinic in the United States where vascular surgery was done in those units in the United States. In those days, we all had to train in England and get the fellowship there because there wasn't a training program in Adelaide. A fellow called Cockett got the job, as you may remember, his operation on the perforated veins, and Savage got the job in Warwick. Fortunately for us, this chap really got stuck into vascular surgery. We were sort of learning how to do the anastomosis and making a pretty much of a mess of it in most cases. I used to say to my friends that uh, we do the bypass on Monday and uh, I'd do the amputation on Thursday. I had some interest in, in arteries, but it was an article from Houston on 317 femoropopliteal reconstructions and another on four repairs of thoracoabdominal aneurysms, three of whom survived, that astonished me, and I felt I had to find out a bit more about this. I, I, we could scarcely believe at that time that such operations could be done. My first exposure to vascular surgery actually was as a child because my father and uncle were in, intimately involved in the development of a cryo surgery at St Vincent's. My father was the chief engineer at Westinghouse and set up the frozen uh, refrigeration for it and Garvin was the pathologist and my uncle Justin Fleming was the surgeon. It was an era in the 50s where there was a generation of post-war surgeons who were actually properly trained rather than the, the, the GP surgeons who dominated the field. I think. Instrumentation improved in the early 60s. You know, from soft atraumatic clamps, various shapes and sizes that you could really manoeuvre into tight situations. One of the great, the great changes that occurred there during the 60s was, <coughs> was blood transfusion and I can I can recall you know when I was a, a student seeing I remember one night with an aortic 40 bottles lined up against the wall of the operating theatre that had been used in a in an aortic operation when they were taking out the whole thing and bleeding from the veins. In 1957 the first graft that I put in at North Shore Hospital was woven nylon and when you cut it the edges frayed so it wouldn't hold stitches so you had to cauterise it to make a little rim right. which would hold the stitches. That was the first and last that I did, it wasn't pleasant. Alan had his wife in the, in the uh, theatre corridors at Sydney Hospital where they were using nylon shirts which were very popular in the, uh, in the sort of late 50s. Came in the most fantastic psychedelic colours and were see-through. They looked terrible on people, but they were all right for aortic grafts and, and they were tailoring them to the, a particular size and Mrs Sharp was sewing them up and he was putting them in. Um, that also happened in Queensland, I think Sam Malik's wife used to sew, sew a few grafts. And... Yes, well, the manufacturing of the grafts 
was done because the authorities um, were not very keen on vascular surgeon, surgery at all. Um, fortunately, Dr. Owen Powell at the PA was very supportive, but the authorities weren't and refused. They were not going to waste the government, the hospital money on grafts, so they refused to supply grafts. So we didn't have a lot of choice, and Sam used to um, give me the dimensions, and um, the, one of the companies provided us with Teflon, and we, used to, we made them at home out of Teflon, on the, on, it, it, on the old um, machine, and made them all for some months. And eventually, the authorities said, well, there were quite a lot of patients going through, quite a lot of people were needing grafts, so perhaps there was something in vascular surgery after all. And Dr. Mellick, I, I felt sure, wanted to be doing that first operation at this brand new hospital. So we, we then wrote ourselves into the book then. We could all relax. And so at, uh, later on, that I did a, a lot of his vascular work and we enjoyed that. And it was a, a character building that vascular surgery and vascular anaesthetics. You often wonder, you know, there must be some better way to earn a quid. But. Dick Jepson was doing aneurysms at the Queen of Liz. Darcy Sutherland was doing them at the Royal Adelaide. Uh, Professor Jepson was a very kind person, but he was a, a person that somehow brought the best out of you. I first was involved with vascular surgery probably as a student in about 1965 or 66 at Royal Perth Hospital helping Gerhard Ebach do a ruptured abdominal aortic aneurysm. And uh, he came to Perth in about 1965, a tremendous chap to work with, a good technician. Then I saw how it really could be done well by Gerhard Ebach and Bob Payton and I thought, well, it could only get better. Well, my recollection was that certain prominent people, in particular uh, Doug Tracy and Scotty McLeish, spoke against the motion that we separate totally from general surgery. Uh, I believe first and foremost we're all general surgeons. Do they have to be trained to do uh, Doppler, get a diploma in ultrasound? Do they need to have to do be trained in uh, endovascular catheterization. I, I think the movement towards that was irresistible by then. There was a lot of animus in council. So it's a changing field, and uh, I don't regret specialization in vascular surgery at all, but uh, I don't think we should lose sight of the fact that there are many aspects of surgery uh, to which we all have to attend whether we're vascular, urological, neurosurgical, and so on. I recall well from one of my peripheral training jobs here as a registrar, the general surgeon said he'd done 13 ruptured aneurysms, and he was none for 13, not one survivor. And it clearly became obvious that this was a separate specialty with, for people who knew what they were doing in that particular sphere of work. Because it became very clear that people who were doing this particular amount of work repetitively and frequently, particularly if they were properly trained, got so much better results. It was an emerging specialty with a rapidly increasing workload and so the general surgeons were busy in those days and uh, so the vascular surgery uh, specialty unfolded. Uh, the numbers of people doing vascular surgery was gradually increasing so that at the end of the general scientific meeting in Hobart in 1972, those interested in vascular surgery discussed this topic and at the end of the meeting and uh, with the help of Ray Chapman who had helped me in drawing up a constitution, we moved and I think it was passed without dissent that the, form, that the college form a section of vascular surgery. I see the college as the trunk of a tree with I think now approximately 11 large branches, all of which have their twigs. But if those branches become disconnected, I think the public will suffer. Well, I was guided into vascular surgery after general surgery training, which was the pattern of things. 
in the 1970s. And I was fortunate enough to have as one of my mentors, uh, Scotty McLeish here, uh, and his stories of Houston uh, were hard to believe. And the horizons expanded uh, in Houston immensely. So that uh, there are a number of times that I saw things that I didn't believe could be done. Certainly when I arrived uh, in the unit as a registrar in 76, which is just after the unit had been fought, it could have been 75, uh, I was impressed immediately by the way that the unit epitomised the, the, the word unit. It was a group of four people, Ian Ferguson, Ken Stutchbury, Sam Rosengarten and Elf Barnett who actually worked together as a unit. In Western Australia in 74, vascular had already been formally separated from general surgery by Bob Payton. I think Bob Payton was the driving force. He saw that uh, if, you, if vascular surgery was to uh, be carried out appropriately, then it had to have its own unit and its own ward. The, the Mai Tai Vascular Group uh, was a group of 11 vascular surgeons who met up in Hawaii. Uh, part, just, the only one I knew before was Justin Miller, and they came from every state. Gerhard Ebart from Western Australia organised it. It was a five-week trip to the USA, visiting about six units and taking in two or three conferences. And uh, I'd only just opened the unit at uh, Flinders two years before, so it was a great eye-opener for me. I learned as much from my Australian colleagues as I did from the Americans we visited. Um, two Mai Tais on jet lag was a great cure for the, uh, the trip from Sydney to Honolulu. I, I think uh, vascular surgeons today would have progressed to their present state in spite of the vascular the Mai Tai society. I remember those wonderful diagrams he used to draw by hand with all his complications and show them at international meetings, but he was very much the conscience of the international vascular scene. Everybody knew him at all those uh, international meetings, like the International Society of Cardiovascular Surgery, and uh, he was a legend in his own time. Well, as, as, as has been said, you know, I think that uh, Justin was our alter ego. Uh, at conferences, he would present the most horrendous cases and he would, he would really just sort of bring it to the surface the sort of fears that all surgeons have, that when they put a clamp on, the aorta might just fall apart. He said to me once that people thought he was vague, but anyone who could find an aircraft carrier in the middle of the Pacific flying a Spitfire had to have something you know, going for them, and I think that was true. He was prepared to share his, his failures, uh, and, and he did it, uh, because he wanted people to know and to learn and not to make that mistake. And I think it's a mark of a mature person that they can get up and actually say, look, I did this and I got it wrong, you know, and, and learn from it. And that was one of his great uh, assets. In the end of the 1960s, Alan Sharp in Sydney who was a general surgeon with a vascular interest, particularly in sympathectomies, tried to get people to join the International Society. He must have been an early member. I actually, with Sam Malik, uh, joined the executive committee meeting of the ICVS. Uh, we were told that if we were going to go forward, we would need to uh, have a number of members at large in order to form a chapter. In actual fact, the requirement was he had to have 50. And Justin uh, kept phoning me up to say, hey, will you rouse up a few Victorians to join the, um, to join the ISCVS? So I sort of became his, um, his Victorian recruiting agent in the, uh, in the beginning. And uh, we finally, had a, 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 a chapter established and uh, with Justin as the uh, president and uh, Bob Lusby as the secretary. Because I think they thought I had little else to do just having started in a new job, I was elected secretary treasurer. But of course that's really a, 
a key role in any society because often you get to do the work and, and set a, some of the agenda at least. Uh, in 2001 uh, we changed the name from the chapter to the to the ANZSVS uh, and it was in that year that we adopted a new constitution uh, which enabled the amalgamation of the, the um, ANZSVS and the division of vascular surgery. The situation had changed completely though by uh, uh, by the mid 90s, there was an increasing divide uh, between cardiac and, and vascular. It all started in about 1961 when uh, my boss, uh, Mr. Neil Johnson, uh, suggested that it would be a good idea to measure blood flow and uh, the uh, reader in medicine at the Royal Melbourne, Austin Doyle, uh, had a, a strain gauge plethysmograph. And in uh, 1978 I went to the United States and uh, spent quite some considerable time with Wesley Moore and I purchased an oculoplethysmograph, which is a machine that you attach to each eye and it measured the arrival of the carotid pulse wave in the eye. I think the 80s saw establishing better criteria for intervention. And so having worked in uh, Bristol with duplex scanning, um, I was actually recruited by Bill Ehrenfeld and Ron Stoney to go to San Francisco and set up a vascular laboratory there, uh, which I did. And we then got uh, involved with the Hofrel company, and Hofrel was one of the first pioneers of ultrasound for clinical purpose. Uh, in St Mary's in London, the B-mode and uh, the directional Doppler were combined and of course this was the beginnings of a so-called duplex scan. Mm. The progression of the labs since the 80s is that they've become uh, much more specialised as opposed to a generalised department of clinical measurements. They've, um, uh, the, the ultrasound of course is much uh, higher fidelity and, and you know, third, fourth generation equipment compared with that, the equipment back then. It was very interesting to see how these techniques were first shunned by the vascular surgical community, and they took quite some time to think that there could be any substitute for a FEMPOP bypass. Well, it really started with um, occlusive disease, and um, for me, it started with atherectomy. And I had um, been in the United States, and I was at a meeting at the uh, Bay Area Vascular Society one evening, and they, this guy came along who was a cardiologist, which was unheard of. And in those, um, amongst those people were Ron Stoney, Aaron Felt, who were really bitterly against any form of intervention, and still are. And as a consequence, when this fellow was invited, you could feel the, the atmosphere, you know, it was really unhappy. And I, I thought it was a bit of a novelty and I wasn't paying much attention until he started talking about angioplasty. And that just um, blew my, um, my brain away to some extent. And I said, I've got to find out how this happens. But then we went over and observed and uh, learned from John Anderson in Adelaide. And that was a remarkable experience at Ashford when we went over there. But, but he was, had consummate skills. And then we brought these, these uh, pictures of these techniques back and discussed them at our various surgical forums. And it really ignited an interest in all of the surgical people there. Even those outside vascular surgery could see that there was something going on here. A number of devices were coming out at the time. And one of them was an atherectomy device known as a, a tech device. And the uh, medical company representative suggested I come to Adelaide to meet John because he was using this device and I would get an introduction to it. So that was my introduction to John. And uh, our relationship survived, whereas the ather atherectomy device did not. But still, it got us started. I'd say that the first paper presented by Perotti. Uh, I think in San Francisco, it was a breakfast session, he had six cases. And that meeting usually has about 2,000 odd people, and the breakfast sessions are popular. 
20 people turned up, Jim May and myself were among them, because it just seemed outrageous that anyone could fix an aneurysm uh, using this technique. So when one, when Parodi was going to go to uh, Royal Prince Alfred Hospital and the flyer for the hospital meeting came out, I saw that, I just jumped at it and saw that they could actually treat aneurysms with an endograft. The ingredients for me were already in raw Perth. We already had the skills in interventional radiology from the work in the 80s. We already had the uh, technical skills in terms of putting devices together because that had been developed. Michael has really been our, our leader in the treatment of an aneurysmal disease in Australia. With regard to the formation of a division of vascular surgery, in 1981 the College Council decided to set up a divisional format with separate divisions for orthopaedics, plastic surgery, neurosurgery, ENT and so on, nine of them, but vascular surgery was not asked did they want to become a division at all, it was assumed that they would be part of the division of general surgery. And, and they actually were galvanised into action uh, uh, at the Sydney uh, GSM, as it was called in those days in 1991. John Harris was the convener of that meeting, and he wrote to Bob Payton at the time to say general surgery were allowing almost no time for vascular surgery in the meeting. Uh, and so, after, well, basically at that meeting, uh, it was moved by Bob Payton that we form a division of uh, uh, vascular surgery to be distinct from general surgery. It, it, was, it was just a gradual um, recognition that vascular surgery was a specialty in its own right which prompted then the, the move to get a division of uh, vascular surgery which actually meant that it was then recognised as a specialty. Retirement is not, as they say, a rest. That's a bit of peripheral arterial surgery. The question is who, who in, among the Australians have taken vascular surgery forward. I actually think there's a whole lot of people who have done that and from every state. I'm of a generation that has really benefited from the previous generation of what she and Ferguson and Ken are, are part of where they're actually working out the operations of vascular surgery and in fact what they were demonstrating to us as trainees was a, a sense of adaptability, a sense of an inquiring mind and in fact I think it's those attributes that have enabled us to embrace endovascular surgery so easily. And again, I think we owe them a debt of gratitude. I, I think we've punched above our weight as a specialty. I'm sure that we'll be doing more and more minimally invasive work. I'm amazed at the changes in the sense of the development of endoluminal arterial surgery. Uh, I wouldn't have believed it uh, in my day, and I'm not sure that I believe it now. <laughs> I have no regrets because I think it will continue to progress. There are many more things to be done, and we will have to do that hand in hand with developing technology.